So about two years ago, I was sitting in a classroom a lot like this one, except it was in Oklahoma. And I heard possibly one of the strangest sentences I have ever heard anybody speak in their entire life. Our professor was talking about something, and he eventually said, he kind of threw out a phrase, and he said, oh, it's just kind of an offhand. He said, by the way, there's a town in western Oklahoma that calls itself the wind energy capital of the state. Anyway, and then he moved on, and I have no idea what he moved on to because in my head, all I could think was, whoa, 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 back that train up for me. There's a town in western Oklahoma that calls itself a wind energy cap, that's like proud of wind energy? Because I realize I, I've moved halfway across the country, but I don't know if you guys know anything about western Oklahoma or Oklahoma in general, but in this state, oil and gas is king. To, to say anything bad about the industry is next to, if not, sacrilege. Um, it is an industry that is incredibly economically important. It's incredibly socially important. It's incredibly historically important. And there are a lot of people that base their identity and their belonging to the state off of oil and gas. So for there to be a town out there saying, and the, for the government of a town to be saying, oh, we're the wind energy capital, my immediate thought was, man, there's got to be a lot of conflict there. There have got to be people that just hate their local government's guts for saying this. Because, because, because these things compete, right? Oil and gas and wind are things that don't go together. They're, they're, they're diametral opposites. And so you can't be friendly to one and be friendly to the other. We're talking about a state where this is a photo taken off of somebody's back porch. And this is a hydraulic fracturing rig that is probably about 200 feet uh, from where this particular person was standing to take this picture. And a lot of people do not consider this abnormal or even bad. For, a lot of peop for some people, but for a good number of others, this is considered prideful. This is, hey, look, we got one. We got one right in our backyard. They're extracting all that awesome oil and gas from underneath where we live and one of our neighbors or a farmer next to us or whomever is going to get money for selling all that. So why would a place that's prideful of oil heritage look at this and have the exact same reaction. Hey, look at that. My neighbors are getting money. There's tax revenue coming in. This is economic activity. This is, I, it, it seemed weird to me. Because on one hand, you've got something that is considered green and liberal and clean energy and climate change fighting. And on the other hand, you've got this kind of socially conservative mind frame that should be, at least on paper, against all of those things. So I went to this town, Woodward, Oklahoma, right up here in the corner, because that was the town that we were talking about. And I wanted to find this conflict, and I wanted to document it sociologically, and explain it, and explain why it arose, and maybe how we could avoid that conflict in the future. Because obviously, I'm, I'm pro-wind. I want to see it out there. But I don't want there to be conflict. I want it to be as easy as possible and equitable as possible. So I came up with this one big question. And that question was, if wind energy, which is a clean and alternative energy source, is introduced into a community that has built a collective identity on oil and gas for all of its history, what will the impact be on identity and sense of place to the residents that live there? Uh, to back up, one of the things about a lot of towns, the smaller ones, in the western part of the state is that they are where they are because there's oil there. And Woodward really isn't any different. It was founded because they thought there was going to be oil nearby and as people came to the region to try to explore and find it, they needed a place to shop, to stay, for entertainment, for supplies, for uh, railroad routes coming through. And so Woodward and towns like it developed because that's where the oil and gas is. So you're talking about something that is their entire history is pegged to oil and gas, and their culture and their heritage, and they will tell you, we are an oil state, or an oil town. You're talking about a town where this is a picture of a sign in a public display that I took. And if you can't read it, it says, about 6,000 years ago, God created the earth, you, and oil and natural gas. Because those are the three most important things that we cling to as an identity in this state. So you're talking about an incredibly conservative place. And in fact, there was an expose in CNN that uh, uh, Woodward County has one of, if not the highest rates of climate change denialism in the entire country. 
peg that or, or pair that up with the oil and natural gas heritage, and you can see where my wheels start turning. I'm like, ooh, there's got to be all this headbutting going on. But there is a lot of wind in the state, though. The resources are really, really good. Um, this comes, by the way, from the, the Oklahoma Department of Commerce. On the left is um, a, a diagram of some really good, constant, consistent, high-level uh, wind speeds just above the ground where turbines sit. And you can see it basically encompasses the entire uh, Midwest as well as Texas and Oklahoma, parts of the south. And there's one particular patch that's especially good and it's right here that encompasses the kind of the northern part of the panhandle of Texas, some of western Oklahoma, and some of southern Kansas. And if you notice, Woodward is sitting smack in the middle of this. This is what's known as a class four area, and it is one of the largest and best areas for wind speeds onshore, not excluding offshore, uh, in the entire country. So it would make sense that if any town were to develop as a hub of extracting the resources from this region, it would be Woodward. But remember, we've still got the oil and gas floating out there. Whoops. Uh, and then to sort of double down, this is actually from the uh, Tourism and Recreation Department. They offered a wind turbine self-guided tour, directions to leave Woodward and go down country roads and look at all the turbines and then whip back into town, which I actually took this as part of my study. But. So that leaves us with this question, effectively, right? How are wind farms perceived? And to my great surprise, the answer was generally positively, which I did not expect to happen. I had people tell me that it's something the community has embraced, that they're totally on board with it. They totally, they see it as progress. They think that it's pretty or they've been fascinated with them all along. But this wasn't always the reaction. Sometimes I had people tell me that I don't know, you know whether they're good or bad, I just know that they're there. I think they could have been positive, but I think it was kind of forced on us. And there were some, some kind of key themes and some key lines of discourse that came about through this case study that I was conducting. Um, four that I've illustrated here, a lot of people talked about schools, saying you know they're not really pretty, but economically it's been a boost, especially for schools. And then tax revenue more broadly, people would say that it provides a lot of revenue for the government, for schools, for landowners, for business owners, tax base in general. And so they say it's been a great addition to this part of the state. And the aesthetics. People would say that you know, some people do have trouble with the breakup of the community, the view of the vista or whatever. People did recognize the change in the viewscape as negative. But on the whole, the vast majority of people I talked to still supported wind energy. In fact, traffic was something else that fit into this category. Somebody told me that you know, we deal with the fact that they, meaning the transport trucks, may break down at our major intersection. But they went on to clarify, you know, that's just a hiccup as they go through town. That's, that's all that is. And to give you an example, this is a photo that I took of a tower section going through the biggest intersection in town. And you can see it dwarfing the giant SUVs, the normally giant SUVs that are surrounding it. This particular vehicle was not broken down, but you can imagine if that were to become, to break down in that intersection, in the busiest intersection in town, the convergence of two highways, you can imagine the kind of backups that can occur. I got stuck in a few. So while they were generally positive toward the development of wind turbines in their town, they also recognized that there were some negative aspects, right? The noise is a little irritating. The view's not exceptionally pretty. Some people thought they were, they were beautiful and loved the view, but a lot of people said, well, you know, it's not great. Uh, the traffic's a little bit of a concern. There might be a little bit of safety or some future land use issues. But on balance, the majority of people said, no, 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 but this is great. Don't get me wrong. We love this. We want absolutely more of this. And so that basically then led to one very sociologically an academically worded question that I had. But why? Why, when you have this heritage and this identity build up around oil and gas, if, I, if you stick a bunch of wind turbines in the ground, why are you also prideful and glad to have that? And I was honestly incredibly confused until I spoke with one particular respondent. And they told me this. Because the price of oil and gas, what somebody in Saudi Arabia decides today doesn't affect whether or not the wind blows here. We're proud of our wind, and we've always been an energy town. 
And when I heard him say that, to say a light bulb went off in my head would be a bit of an understatement. A floodlight went off and I suddenly kind of had a realization about a component that you may have caught onto that I had been missing throughout my entire time up to this point. And it's that he didn't say we're an oil town, he said we're an energy town. And I had a lot of other people I know to start reflecting this similar kind of statement. They said Woodward's an energy type of town, you know? We have the oil and gas, now we have the wind. Somebody else told me, I thought you were going to say that we were the energy's capital because I don't think of one specific company or industry as the monogram up here. Or uh, one particular respondent uh, got a little bit exasperated at my line of questioning and said, it sounds like someone's being defensive about maybe the oil and gas industry being shut out of the process and acting like that's not really an important part of our local economy, which, hello, it sure is, which was, was kind of a, a funny moment of levity for me. So. When people in Woodward see a picture like this, what I saw was conflict. I was sure this had to be conflicting, right? But what they saw was, hey, what we do here, who we are, is we extract energy and then we ship it out and we power an entire nation off the resources that we have. So we've been getting it from below the ground, now we're also getting it from above the ground. And I had a lot of people tell me, oh, can you also give us solar? Oh, can you also give us geothermal? Oh, can you also give us hydroelectric? At which point in my head I thought, we're on the high plains of Oklahoma. You don't have a lot of rivers. I'm not sure. The, you know, but I appreciate your enthusiasm, right? And agriculture as well in the area is incredibly large. That's the other major, major industry. You have oil and gas and agriculture and then basically other economic activities to support those things. So other people too look at a photo like this and they see conflict, right? Oh, isn't this terrible? There's a field back there and you've just erected a giant turbine in it and you can't farm that land. But a lot of people in Woodward would have told me, no, 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 we can still farm around it, but now we have some steady income from the wind turbine, which is an incredible boon both to that farmer and to our community at large. So these things too were seen as, this was not seen as a conflict either. Which of course led to another very sociologically and academically worded question, but how? Okay, so now I've got the why. I understand why these things don't conflict and why they like them both, but how? Is there some kind of a, a framework or a theory or a sociologic method or something that I can apply to this to kind of make sense of it in an academic frame that I can then write about and talk about and discuss? So by show of hands, Who's heard of the NIMBY concept? The not in my backyard, right? So this is the sort of thing where if somebody wants to come in and build wind turbines or fracking or a plastics plant or a chemical plant or it could, it could literally be anything and the community bands together and they say, no, you don't build that here, not in my backyard, you don't. And they run them out of town. This has been used as a, a framework to view either the either the uh, rejection of change, sociologic and uh, technologic change, or in some cases the lack of NIMBY is sort of used as an explanation for the acceptance of it, right? We, we, people would like to say, oh, well, you know, they accepted the wind turbines because they just didn't have NIMBY that day. But the problem with NIMBY is that it makes this assumption that people have selfish motivations for their decisions and that they, they, they view things as valuable to themselves based on whether or not they like it or dislike it for various reasons. And that's a very, very simplistic framework to try to wrap around humans that are stupidly complex things. And there are actually a few cases in my case study that, that NIMBY would predict would be impossible. One of the standouts was I had a, somebody in town, a business owner, tell me that he had a hunting lodge out in the prairie. And during deer season, he used to go out there every weekend. And that was his escape. And that was his getaway. And he would go there, he would stay. Sometimes he would hunt, sometimes he would just hang out. He was by himself, he enjoyed the view. It was perfect, it was peaceful, it was blissful. But then the wind industry came in. And they built turbines on an adjacent farmer's land so close to his hunting lodge that the noise from the turbines made it so he couldn't sleep at night. And he told me that after they came in, I don't really go there anymore. I just stopped. 
I loved it, but I, I, I can't do it anymore. It's, it's, too, it's, it's too disrupted. It's, it's been ruined. And NIMBY would assume that this individual would hate wind industry. But when I asked him then what his overall opinion was of that industry and of the development, he said, don't get me wrong, it's been negative on me personally, but I see the good that it does in the community. I see the effect that it has for other people. For that farmer who the turbines are on his land, it's disruptive to me, but it's a source of income for him, steady income, which means the town then in my business has a form of steady income and, and, and cash flow coming through the turbines to the farmer and back into town. So we said, yeah, it's been bad for me personally, but on balance, I support it because I can't deny what it's done in our community. So if we can't use NIMBY, what can we use? And there were two frameworks that I ended up examining. One is called sense of place theory. And sense of place theory says that people don't just live in an area. They form relationships, social relationships, connections to the place, to other people, to society at large, to communities. And if you disrupt sense of place in, a, in specific ways, it can actually be described by people in terms of grief or loss. Think about in Maryland what the Chesapeake Bay or what blue crabs mean to the state. If the Chesapeake Bay were to just evaporate and go away, or if all the crabs were to go extinct, there would be an incredible social and cultural pain and loss that would be felt in the state because that's such an important rallying point for people around the state socially. And this is an example of sense of place. One particular example that I really, really like, this is a case study that comes out of the UK. And what you're looking at here is the North Sea, which if you know anything about the North Sea, they have seen an incredible amount of offshore wind development uh, all up and long in this area. And there's two, to give you a bearing, I mean, here's Wales, we've got um, England and Scotland coming up here, Ireland across the way. And there's two towns right down here. Um, one I'm going to completely mispronounce, Landaduno, and then another one, Colwyn Bay. And they're right by each other on the coast. And it's interesting because in the first town, uh, Landaduno, they describe themselves as being a tourist destination. They have a beautiful view of this bay. And that's what makes their town great. And people come from across Europe to stay in their bed and breakfast, to stay in their hotels, to visit, to spend time on the water, and to look at that bay. And that's what we do, and that's who we are. Meanwhile, a short way down the coast, in Colwyn Bay, they describe their town to researchers as being run down, as being forgotten, abandoned, as being stagnated. They used to be a center of industry, but that industry has since long moved on to other parts of the world, and with it, the pride of the town went out the door as well. They just said, you know, we're just kind of here, we're stuck, we're stagnant, nothing's going on. And then, both towns, ah, this comes out of uh, uh, Devine Wright and Howe's 2010, which is a, a fantastic case study, but uh, both towns shared this view. And the impact that it had on each town, despite being the exact same stimulus and the exact same view, could not have been more different. The people of, Leland, of Landaduno said, this is terrible. You've destroyed our town. You've ruined it. We had a beautiful view of the bay, and now it's, it's ruined and destroyed by these turbines. People aren't going to come to our town anymore. We're going to lose out on economic revenue. We, we don't know who we are. This, we had this beautiful natural bay, and now it's not natural anymore, and you've destroyed our town. This is terrible. Meanwhile, the people in Colwyn Bay looked at this, and they said, oh, this is great. This is fantastic, because we've been stagnating, and we've been stuck for so long with nothing going on, and now we have activity. We have industry again. We have people that are coming in, installers, shipbuilders, people that are coming in to put these things, pile drivers, coming into the ground. We've got people coming into our restaurants, our shops, our hotels. We finally have something going again, and this is a sign of progress, that we're finally not stuck in the same place that we've been for how many decades? And this is an example of sense of place, right? It says that you can't, you can't just take the stimulus and predict, or take the, uh, the stimuli, rather, and predict what the effect will be on people. You have to consider where they live and what the social structure is and the sense of place. 
The other one I mentioned too. The other one is called social representations theory. And social representations theory broadly posits that you can't just take, you can't describe change as just replacing old things with new things because that's not how it works. Especially when it's like a socio-technological change like wind turbines are, people form social meaning and attachments and social representations of existing things in their communities. And so for them to accept a new change, they have to be able to do two things. One is called anchoring, which is tie the new thing to something in the past that's already socially established. And then two is called objectification, which is to make a metaphor for how these things are related. So in the case of oil and gas, you had the new turbine that people said, well, we don't really know what this is, but we're used to pump jacks and we're used to fracking pads and way in the past we were used to oil derricks. And those are big things that kind of stick in the ground, stand up off the horizon and extract energy from the surrounding area. A turbine is effectively the same thing. So the anchoring is turbines are like oil and gas equipment and the objectification is in that they both extract energy. And I had a few people tell me in the same way that windmills that pumped water out of the ground were, were tied as well to the wind turbines that were behind them. That was another case. So eventually, um, I finished my master's thesis, got my degree, got a job out here, and I took up, as we mentioned before, the shore power project. And this is a cover off a report that we had published um, about our successes and the things that we had done. The, project broadly goes to towns and we give them an energy usage baseline. We tell them, hey, here's how much energy you're using. Here's how much it's costing you. Here's where your biggest energy users are. And this is your carbon emissions. And then we give them a roadmap to decarbonize. We tell them, you know, if you were to do you know, X, Y, and Z, you could reduce the amount of energy that you're using and save some money. And then further, we tell them, you know, there are grant opportunities or there are loan programs you can take advantage of, or there are credits or leasing schemes or something that you can use to do this at very, very little cost to yourself overhead. And we use these cost savings to open the door to discussions about climate resiliency more broadly. And we've had a lot of success with this model. Um, Centerville, just down the road, they actually installed a solar array to power their wastewater treatment facility. And we went back with them and took a look at their energy usage after they had installed that array. And what we found was pretty incredible. They were saving $16,000 every single year just by installing that array that they leased. So they didn't pay anything up front for it. They pay a small per uh, kilowatt hour fee back to Solar City, as it were. But almost more importantly, of all the electricity that they need to power their municipal operations, so lights, signals, administration, police, fire, 75% of that electricity is covered carbon free by the output from that array. That's pretty incredible for a town in a rural space that historically rural spaces have been overlooked in this discussion. Um, to keep going, uh, um, Easton has been on a really aggressive campaign, as you can see here, to install a bunch of their older street lights with LED models that are a lot more efficient. In Cambridge, they used our information to set a whole bunch of targets for emissions uh, and efficiency um, goals. And they've been working very slowly to meet those. And some of the, they're on track to take one of their buildings that was costing $100,000 every year in energy and try to bring that down to 60,000. And then uh, Snow Hill, as small as it is, uh, use our information to find information to put in new HVAC systems, lighting upgrades, and also a solar array of their own. But there's more work that needs to be done. Um, rural communities often experience what we call climate, or what we're calling in our project climate discordance. And this means that they have a very high and specific vulnerability to climate change, but they oftentimes have a lower, lower climate literacy. 
So they might not understand how they're going to be impacted, but they stand to be impacted in greater and more specific ways than urban areas would. One example is going back to uh, crabbing and fishing, which is a really economically important, but also socially and culturally important activity in the Chesapeake Bay. Climate change threatens to make those activities harder. And so it's not just a public health risk, or it's not just an economic risk, but it's also a social, cultural, and historic risk. And those, those are factors that are usually relatively specific to rural areas. Rural areas uh, and rural climate and energy needs are oftentimes overlooked, though, by decision makers and people in urban spaces. And typically, rural communities are going to be the ones that are going to host the new clean energy infrastructure. Um, things like solar panels tend to be very land energy or uh, land area intensive, right? To put 300 megawatts of a, a coal plant somewhere, the footprint's relatively small compared to 300 megawatts of solar, which has a much bigger footprint. So to have something like solar currently, or even wind, you need large land area. And who has large land area? Rural areas do. Except energy consumption is usually greatest in the urban cores. So you set up for, for a debate about inherent fairness when the people that are producing that energy because of land area necessity aren't necessarily getting benefits that they see as fair compensation for hosting that infrastructure. And then something that we call the social gap is often great in these areas. And the social gap is a concept that says that, by show of hands, how, who, or, or shout it out, who, what's the approval rate of something like wind energy or solar energy in the United States by percentage of, of American adults? 50%, 30%, 80%, 30? 40? 40? Higher, 60, higher? 80, you're getting there, 80 to 90. 80 to 90 percent of American adults approve of these. If you just ask them, do you like them? They go, sure. But there's a relatively low success rate for projects when they try to install them in a specific area. And that's what we call the social gap. Why is it that so many people are supportive of these, but when we try to install specific projects, they get defeated, they get resisted? Well, that theoretically, we would think that wouldn't happen, but in rural areas, we see the social gap very, uh, very clearly. And then also, uh, local clean energy projects here, even in the county, in Kent County, have been withdrawn because of objections. So the social gap is alive and well within our own county. But there are some kind of interesting new ideas on the horizon about guiding this energy transition as we start moving into a clean energy future. One of the ones that I'm particularly excited about is a concept called community solar. So I'm assuming since most of you guys are students, you're all students, I guess, if you're sitting here. Um, does anyone rent an apartment or a house, something? Renters, dorm, people in dorms? Does anyone own a house? I do. Back in the back? So we have one, I rent, so we have one person that if they wanted to could put solar panels on their property because they have control of that property and can effectively do what they want. Mm -hmm. You know, homeowners associations excluded. But the rest of us are stuck. Even if we wanted solar, we couldn't get it. But this is where community solar comes in. Instead of putting solar on your residence or on your apartment or on your dorm, which you couldn't do, there is a third party company that can come in, install these arrays, and you can rent panels and then use the output from those as if it were on your roof. So it's like having a virtual panel out there that the third party, they generate, they send it to the utility, they, send, they sell the electricity back to the utility, and the utility takes a chunk of your usage right off your bill. I guess if you're in the dorms, you don't have a bill. But um, this is incredibly exciting, especially for moderate to low income um, populations because they oftentimes are, because of the overhead costs associated with rooftop solar, are locked out of that market, they can't access it, which is, which is an equitability issue. So community solar helps us to solve that. Something else that's, that's really, really new, there's actually two grants, uh, one in Montgomery County and I think one in Prince George's County, to install emergency microgrids. And emergency microgrids basically take a solar array, some kind of a backup, like a big battery, and they hook together maybe a hospital, a gas station, a grocery store and a community center. And on any normal day, 
it functions just like a solar panel sitting anywhere would. And everyone draws from the grid and everybody's happy. But when the grid goes down, those four places and that backup in power generation flip over and become their own microelectric grid. And we now have an opportunity during emergencies to keep vital points of operation for responding to emergencies and keeping life as on track as possible open and operating despite a lack of electricity on the grid as a whole. And this is a new thing for us, to be able to kind of, at least in theory, take what's generally seen as this big monolithic, the grid, and in an emergency, fracture it down into these very, very small little operating units so that we can respond in cases of emergency. Another idea that's really, really, really new is called community choice aggregation. And the idea is that there are laws that we can pass that allow entire communities to come together and say, you know, we want our energy to come from solar or from wind. We want to bundle that together and we want to buy that instead of whatever the utility is selling us. So not in Maryland yet, but hopefully soon. Um, and then another thing called property assessed clean energy or PACE, which is effectively a loan that the county gives you and you repay back on your, on your uh, property taxes. But um, a lot of these ideas are just new ideas. They're floating in the ether, and they've been installed in a few places, but they're not commonplace yet. And we talked about the shortcomings and the challenges that rural places face when it comes to climate change and a clean energy transition. So we, we've applied for funding. Just yesterday, we put in the final grant application. We're trying to expand out the short power project to become the rural energy project. And we're going to do three very critical things. We're going to keep producing those baselines and those roadmaps, and we're going to help towns to continue to decarbonize. We're also going to expand the capacity that we can do that at, and that involves hiring student interns. So there are job opportunities within my lab. If you are jazzed up about energy policy, if you're wonky enough to do that, uh, we would love to talk to you come spring semester contingent on funding. We're also going to do some research. With the social gap being as great as it is and being demonstrated here in the county, we know that there's need to understand the sense of place for rural Maryland, and we're going to also look at rural Delaware and rural Virginia, and figure out what are the unique challenges that have to be overcome for clean energy to be equitably developed in these areas. And we're going to use all of that then for communication and education and outreach components. And we're going to put together workshops and community forums and listening sessions, social media content, all to help overcome those impediments that we identify. 